Okay, all right. So let me introduce Dr. Garami. Dr. Garami, Jolt Garami, is from Hungary. Um, how many people here know who, uh, who uh, Dr. Robacek is? Anybody hear the name Dr. Robacek? You know Dr. Robacek, yeah. He's also Hungarian. Um, anyway, he is an ultrasound, transcranial Doppler, echo specialist who is unbelievably talented in that regard. And he's going to show us some stuff that's going to, I think, really open our eyes. A lot of you might remember uh, Bob Groom from years ago when he talked about TCD and it just kind of fell off the track. Well, I think that whole concept is taking is, is, is having a resurgence because how strokes are defined now in clinical trials is changing. It's no longer did the patient have a stroke because they're drooling and they're like this or they're having some other worse problem. It's obvious to us that they had a stroke. It's now diffusion. Every study has to incorporate diffusion-weighted MRI, which requires them to do a scan baseline and then look and see if there are any new lesions. If there are, the patient had a stroke. So there's going to be a type 1 stroke and a type 2 stroke. And I think we might see that progress into the cardiac field. Already with TAVR, it's a concern because there's a lot of strokes that are happening in TAVR. But how many strokes are happening with us that we simply don't know? Because we don't measure it. It's all a guess. Let me pull this out so it's right. Yeah. OK, Dr. Garani. Thank you, Joe. And I have one minute early. <laughs> uh, let me sit down then. A record. Uh, thank you, and um, I definitely want to show you some new information, so definitely uh, uh, maybe my ultrasound is s skills do not in include the echo part. I'm so sorry for that. So I'm a radiologist by training with the acute stroke uh, neurology background on the other side. So the way I learned ultrasound is to see a lot of acute stroke coming into the emergency room. And one of our nurses told us, you know, when you guys are doing this ultrasound thing giving you on our stroke patients, they all of them doing so much better. So from that, sonothrombolysis was born. So next door, the Herman ER, this is where we work. Uh, this is when in the 90s, the TPA stroke uh, trial was initiated. And in 96, the TPA was approved. And despite of 20 years go by, there's no other IV acute therapy available uh, today. So this is tells us that yes, we have so much advances in the technology, but looks like the medicine is, is really not just following that uh, those footsteps. Um, the ultrasound, what I perform is a carotid and uh, brain ultrasound. Almost it was done before the CT on the brain. So I could predict <coughs> who had ischemic stroke with occlusion in the blood vessels in the brain versus a hemorrhage when the blood vessel remains open. But because of the increased uh, resistance and the increased ICP, those are harder to perfuse. So by uh, asymmetry between the two hemispheres, those are the clues what gave us. And uh, again, we completed the sonothrombolysis trial. We were the clot busters. And the clot busters uh, showed a 20% increase of frequentization if you do ultrasound at the same time with the TPA. So this is telling us that we have a really <coughs> nice diagnostic tool in our hand, which is the ultrasound. All the other tasks, you just shovel your patient in the MRI and the CT and push the buttons and try to take some pictures. Ultrasound is still one of those toys that you're still controlling how you capture those images. And one of my proudest moments that uh, I had acute stroke coming in with the left leg weakness and I saw dissected uh, carotids I called my vascular and uh, cardiothoracic surgeon. 90 minutes later, we were on pump and we are fixing an ascending dissection. If I did, if I would not diagnose the dissection, that t patient would get TPA, and with the TPA given for the ascending aortic dissection, that would be uh, uh, learn an autopsy that what really happened. So there's only one case report we saw that TPA as a stroke medication was given for aortic dissection and it's not good. So the um, other idea of what we had is how to combine a stroke team also with the cardiovascular team 
so my skills coming in is how to diagnose acute stroke bringing into the operating room. So <coughs> in the operating room, try to do stroke prevention. Try to monitor all the carotid cases, all the aortic cases, when we see any problem with our flow in the brain and we can act on it. So it means we don't need to wake up the patient from anesthesia and learn that they cannot move the arm or they cannot move the leg. So I can pick those up with my ultrasound in the operating room so you can transfer the patient under general anesthesia to the neuro intervention suite or neuro uh, interventionist can come to our sp fancy hybrid suite and able to take care of those strokes. So that's my fancy introduction for you, but because you came to Houston with your New Orleans conference, this is why we have to talk about NASA a little bit. And this is one of my uh, favorite two pictures. So when uh, the astronaut Kelly came back uh, after nearly a year in space, uh, within a day, this is his post on Facebook that uh, on the eye, on the carotid, and the heart, immediately everybody were jumping on him uh, to see what are the differences in, in our blood flow, in our heart, in his eyeball. What is the difference in space when there's no gravity, when there's a microgravity, versus uh, landing here? And this was about 24 hours. Landing in Kazakhstan takes about 24 hours to come back to Houston, and probably sometimes 2 o'clock in the morning. Another image is my uh, financial disclosure, that even my daughter on the birthday uh, wish uh, she asked me to do a brain ultrasound for her. <laughs> so uh, this is, I think, definitely <laughs> my genes in the family, so to love to ultrasound. And this is a really stunning image. So this is the age of five. You unlikely, you don't need to go through the fan fontanelle. Just putting a probe on the forehead, I can capture the entire brain. So this is like really, some people say, oh, it's impossible to image through the rocks. What is the oil industry does? They do that. So if, if the oil guys can do image through the rocks, we can do that. And um, unfortunately, um, I'm so sorry about the lady, but indeed, uh, the ladies, they have thicker skull. We all know that. <laughs> so that's the only limitation for my ultrasound. That, uh, and this is seriously, it's not, not, I'm not a joker like Joe, but um, so somehow the ladies' air pockets, how they lose <coughs> that bone density, it's resistant to the ultrasound. So if I have an 80-year-old guy, an 80-year-old lady, most likely I can do ultrasound on the guy and less likely to do an ultrasound on a lady, almost like 50-50 on a lady. So when I can come through here, I, uh, we came up with a solution with a submandibular ICA. We can still do monitoring. And I think it was really a big issue with uh, Taver and the Tabby came along because when you have a new surgery and you really want to learn about the new technique, when we started to do Taver, but you can't get through here, you can st still come through there. And you can see the embolization and the block flow uh, the same <coughs> way, but this is like on the full carotid, so even it means more than rather than just monitoring somewhere in the brain. And um, my cases and my talks will be something that I will bring you to the operating room. I want to show you uh, what the surgeon uh, view is, and my case is more endovascular and some open carotid. Uh, recently, I'm not doing too many uh, open uh, aortic cases, but I did have some uh, uh, with Dr. Safi next door, and I will show you some retrograde cerebral perfusion, how we can really detect what you see as a perfusionist and a surgeon on the field that, yeah, if I cannulate SVC, there's a return on the arterial side to the open field. But nobody would believe you. Does it really go through the brain? I can show you with my brain ultrasound it does. So I think that's when we are guessing. I just don't want to play a poker game and guessing and betting. I want to show you the direct evidence, what is the flow does, and how you can see the flow in the brain with my ultrasound. So what I, I, I want it to, it's a little blurry, but this is one of the NASA conference room. And I will give you a minute to uh, walk through it. So when you walk into NASA, so I, as you can tell on my accent, I'm not American citizen, so I was not American citizen. So when I started to work for NASA for five years, I was not allowed through the gate. So I always had a meeting outside the gate, and this is why you have companies uh, uh, you know, doing all these consultation jobs just outside the gate. 
but after 2011, when I became a uh, citizen, now I'm allowed to go inside and do uh, the direct uh, ultrasound testing. And what my first uh, uh, job was that uh, also with the astronauts, we are really interested in how does the brain blood flow looks like. And this is how they found me with my expertise. And this is what I think what we teach you today, the brain ultrasound part is really something unique and you're not gonna see it in every American hospital, unfortunately. What we're working on, that maybe uh, within a few years, it's not gonna be another surgery you do without uh, uh, cerebral monitoring, and it's a proper monitoring for the brain, so make sure you can prevent those preventable uh, strokes in an uh, operating room. Uh, 2007, 2008, we had this grant, and this is just yesterday while we were setting it up. This is our TCD uh, model, and uh, it was really nice that uh, after NASA used it for the training and when the pump and the tube be clogged up, they said, uh, we would like to give it to you. Oh, thank you. So what we did with Joe and Vicky's assistant, that we did a retubing of the, uh, of the head model, which has a through anatomic uh, circulation for the brain. And it was really made for to train an astronaut how to do the brain ultrasound. And at the same time, we also had the same project trying to make a uh, joystick operated uh, ultrasound probe. Because uh, even that time we were ready <coughs> that uh, right now we are directing the astronaut how to do the ultrasound. And uh, it requires day skill, it requires some communication to the earth, but sooner or later you're not gonna able to do that communication with 16, 20 seconds delay. So it needs to be more automated. So more automated comes in that this will hopefully find a signal automatically and it's instead of a big bulgy one for NASA, you need a tiny, tiny one, and that will be something sitting here or sitting on the submandible area and, and able to monitor these blood flows. And this is the uh, uh, head frame. Um, actually, uh, what I noticed that it's really, I think the model was Joe. Did you guys notice the resemblance? <laughs> I'm so sorry, but the, the top is real. So, <laughs> the, the, so that the rest is plastic, but the, but the top is real. So thank you, Joe, for for giving your head for that model. It's 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 really. Uh, I'm gonna skip this uh, pool party, but uh, I think it's really fascinating to really go and see the ISS. This is Dr. Noon, Dr. DeBakey's student, and uh, he's my reading partner in the vas. Oh, that's my job here actually in the hospital. So with Dr. Noon, we are reading the vascular ultrasound studies for the entire uh, hospital and our patient clinics. Uh, when I'm giving a talk, Dr. Noon is reading. He's only 83, so he's uh, uh, definitely in excellent shape and taking 15 nice calls um, uh, per month. So Dr. Noon is definitely helping me and he <coughs> has this connection to NASA. So everybody called it the DeBakey left ventricular system device, but it was really DeBakey Noon left ventricular system device because it was little Dr. Noon's neighbor with a NASA uh, turbo engine who really made this left ventricular device uh, uh, possible and developed for us. So we'll have uh, a little bit more, um, more of those. Now I want to switch to a DZ NASA slides, and I hope you guys going to enjoy it and learn something. Uh, okay, you're supposed to see something. Okay, you're not seeing it. Let me try it again. Okay, yeah, I just can project something from my screen, but I'm just restarting. This is a fancy uh, DZ uh, software, or we call it Prezi. There's one more Hungarian thing for you. So Prezi is not a PowerPoint, not a keynote, but it's something that you can zoom in and out. Feels like it's a huge poster, and you place your PowerPoint slides, and you're kind of jumping between those. Uh, and Okay. And it's not projecting. So let me plug it in again. If it's not projecting, it's going to be a really fun presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not. Give me a second. Let's see <coughs> what we have in settings. Setting 
display Oh ho ho and there you go. It's black though. You're not gonna enjoy that much. <laughs> <laughs> but you're making progress. Thank you. Um it's I hope it's uh nice, fancy and okay. We're a pretty small group. We can turn your computer around and most of us would probably see it. Mm -mm. You would not. Hold on for a second. Do we have another option with HDMI? Um, see if Roger's out there. Roger! Roger, Roger, come back! Did you get him? No. Oh, there it goes. Look, it's up. <coughs> Where does it came from? Don't worry. <laughs> it's Do you need sound? No, I need to control it. Do you guys see an arrow? Oh. Wow, that is freaking awesome. So, I don't know how it's happened. I don't see it on my computer, but it's here. So, um, I think the fun will be really controlling it. So, <coughs> this is January uh, with the temperature as a Houston winter, I think 77. And really showing you nearby, and if you haven't seen it, it's just worth to drive by, and you don't need to go through the main entrance of the NASA. You just ask, hey, I just came to see the rocket. They let you just go and drive into the rocket park and able to see that. And this is when we have our new baby. You know, they, um, they put the shuttle on the top of the 747, so kind of you can climb up and you can see that. Um. So the interesting part what I think uh, the perfusion what happens in astronauts is really relevant for everyday clinical practice that what the astronauts are experiencing is not a VIP syndrome so testing your eyesight VIIP cool Vir visual impairment with increased intracranial pressure so what happened when they did the shuttle for two weeks nothing happened to the eyes but in the moment they are up for three months, the venous congestion and the venous not draining their brain, so the venous congestion put the increased increased pressure on the eyeball. So that was the only soft thing you bring in, they can push on. So the brain with a dura, a little bit more solid, and what happens, the really the optic nerve sheet is really like a cul-de-sac that it takes all the intracranial pressure on the back of the eyeball and um, so it's not just uh, American diseases, definitely the uh, Russians are uh, also show that it's almost like 50% on astronaut and it's not uh, <coughs> uh, a reversible damage. So we have, you know, the NASA open up their book and they show us 67 different medical problems what uh, they are looking for uh, treatment for and uh, this is what they see. So basically that uh, uh, pressure behind the eyeball is changing the eyesight. And again, another part is that uh, we really wanted to investigate with ultrasound what really happens because you don't have an MRI there. They do have these uh, OCT for the eyeball, but the ultrasound is real simple to measure just the optic sheet and diameter. And what we learned in NASA, then we brought it back to a hospital and indeed, we, we did have a few patients we couldn't take to the CT to learn what's going on, why the mental status changed. And based on this optic nerve sheet diameter, we did diagnose a few increased intracranial pressure for sure. So the venous congestion, and we were chatting yesterday about, indeed, sometimes you have your uh, venous outflow blocked, and this is what can happen when, again, the head's falling up and you just can perfuse more because you don't have a return. So the same thing, this is the same guy. He got younger 10 years just going up in space. So this is before going up in space. This is head in space after one day. So you can see how much the head is swollen. And I remember my most swollen head uh, was a 
gentleman who received almost a hundred units, arm, everything swollen, and I supposed to see some blood flow changes, and the blood flow was fine. But it's just <coughs> extremely uh, a high f uh, uh, flow of everywhere. So this is where you obviously see the changes, and I think what we need to understand, whatever we learn on Earth, and we need to forget about it and learn again what we, we see on these astronauts. But uh, again, <coughs> our ultrasound is the only diagnostic true test available up in space, so we don't have a CT, we don't have an MRI, all the fancy stuff. We do lots of pre and post uh, imaging on them. And why I think it's, uh, oh, the pressure. This is one of my favorite points of uh, pointing the minus 20 uh, Venus pressure goes to plus 20. This is exactly the pressure gradient I need to overcome when I do the retrograde cerebral perfusion. So the venous arterial side differences, if I want to reverse the cerebral perfusion, is exactly 40 mercury. So this is really interesting that, again, what we see in space similarities and what we see in the operating room is quite scary and it just reminds us why those numbers are so magical. And again, what we try to do is uh, we try to mimic, uh, simulate, and they have certain people, they're getting paid for laying down for three months, and this is how they're trying to test on Earth what is the zero gravity does to you. I think they have a smoke break uh, for five minutes every three hours, but probably I can imagine what, how to live for three months in, in bed, uh, voluntarily, so not as a patient and stuff. Another amazing thing is that based on the body position, your venous drainage is different from the brain. So while you're laying down, your main drainage is coming from your jugular. <coughs> while you're sitting or standing, your <coughs> venous return coming from the vertebral veins. And it's kind of stunning that, you know, the vertebral veins are really tiny, and especially in the cervical part, it's running in the in a uh, transverse bone tunnel together with the artery. So why you can imagine the jag is jugular able to extend and kind of get smaller, that has more limitation with uh, with the vertebral. The vertebral doesn't have an option to extend that much. So this is why it's still fascinating that uh, based on the body position, the vein is drainage is definitely different from the brain. And why is that important? Because in the moment you have a really closed physical area in the head, and again brain tumors or something, just increasing your pressure by a bleeding in the brain, going to increase that pressure. So one of the sample um, model or what we're trying to mimic is just a hydrocephalus. When, when is again, one of the CSF um, flu is blocked and the increased CSF just dilates the lateral ventricles and the brain just kind of handles this huge pressure or uh, this is how we can study what's going on in astronaut brain compared to our patient's brain uh, with these in, in increased intracranial pressure and how we see that. So the first the Russians came up with these cool ideas to how to decrease the amount of blood you're circulating by putting tourniquets on the leg and that tourniquets remains on the entire flight so it's not just like socks you pull up and take it off so that really needs to be there. But my really favorite part is this uh, negative pressure pins. So think about if you have any constipation or something, this would be probably a proper treatment too. Um, definitely, uh, you need to wear diapers if you have these negative pressure pins on. But that is, again, trying to suck down the venous flow towards the leg. And this is how it's trying to help your circulation without the gravity. Um, I did have a picture of the constipation, so this is the difference between an American and a Russian uh, toilet. So indeed, they, they are. Uh, you can see which is the uh, honey. Honey. What's the ma American made? Honey something. Honeywell. Honeywell. Yes, and then probably the Russian. So you can see which one has more screws. <laughs> so sorry, that was not fair. So the true diagnosis and what we wanted to compare the uh, uh, cognitive function changes in the operating room, uh, we call it the space stupidity. So this is what really happens that when you cannot perform a task during the first two days in your, in your mission, and it's something that we, medication, my is all everything, we're trying to bring the pressure and we treat into into increased intracranial pressure in the first two days. <coughs> my uh, first... Uh, 
uh, task was that I was a physician who was going up in space, so that was so much easier to train the guy how to do ultrasound. We did a pre-flight, in-flight, and post-flight test on him, and we did have a more sophisticated IRB than anywhere else, so you can imagine this is why his face is blocked, despite that he's my colleague, and he gave his name, and you know we can show the data. So for NASA rules, I either I can show the gentleman face, or I can show you data. So I choose to show you data. So what's unique here, that we are doing ultrasound on the carotid and the jugular and the same time in the brain. So this is something that we did it the first time. They were brain ultrasound done before, but this was the first time that we really investigated the intra and extracranial circulation in the same time and simultaneously with uh, five different um, uh, positions. We always uh, started with a standing position, sitting, laying down, 15 degrees, head down, and then 30 down. And this is, um, again, we do kind of similar stuff in the operating room when we do those head down. So our part was also we wanted to see how the alpha regulation is still intact. So testing with, with normal ventilation, <coughs> hyperventilation, and hypoventilation. So this is looks like this even this two minutes, this is like an hour and a half, solid hour and a half spend uh, with just testing. And um, it's really hard to train. Well, there's not too many guys who knows how to do brain ultrasound, but I did have 30 minutes with the uh, astronauts. And there's a little precious 30 minutes. I trained him everything. So he knows how to do his carotid and, and the brain, and he can do. And we repeated the same exam um, in the space station, just with a normal and uh, uh, hyperventilation, hypoventilation. And it's definitely uh, when we had the whole, so the, the ultrasound probes are belong to each machine. So we had to run three or four machines simultaneously. So you can imagine that we have a good team of uh, working together. This is when I want to make you dizzy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, without any alcohol. Um, and this is the minus 30. I just wanted to show you how scary that 30 is. Like, it's not even a big number. But when you look at the guy, is falling and head down. It's like I wanted to put those pillows there. And uh, really, it was um, my favorite part of when I learned. is like, why well, you guys are colored? Are you back to uh, kindergarten? Or and he said, no, you will see. So based on the telling the which button to push, and I think on your equipment, when I see all those thingy bingies, what you need to push, so much easier to say to the astronaut, push brown two, push blue three, push uh, pink two. So when you are uh, totally comfortable to direct your student or direct your training, hard to get used to those buttons and you see the color easier rather than reading and making a mistake and, oh, oh oopsie not that one the other one so that w how you will able to correct those mistakes which button to push and it's so much easier to direct to direct them and I think this is part of the training what we're learning from NASA so this is how my brain ultrasound Doppler looks like this is your arterial line so your arterial line is one of them is Collecting, uh, collecting data from the right posterior cerebral artery. The other one is collecting uh, with the uh, left middle cerebral artery. So I try to do anterior and posterior circulation. So I only have option for two probes. I wish I have four probes or six probes. But this is the two data I can capture. And I do have the same value. So my TCD, I'm following my mean flow velocity calculated as your mean arterial pressure and you're going to see that anything on, you, on our videos that is really shows the nice correlation between the mean and the arterial pressure and my TCD and uh, I push a delta percentage when I start the case so that is my baseline so from the baseline I don't need to remember what was my pressure when I started <coughs> I'm just watching my baseline and 20 percent change from a baseline is kind of so, so I need to wake up anesthesiologist time to time that uh, maybe the pressure is low, but my TCD tells me how much flow the patient really needs. And in this case, we're just watching that. And we'll have one more number in the operating room when we're counting the microemboli. But again, I wanted to emphasize that the TCD is not just counting emboli. 
but it's really give you the whole hemodynamics of the brain and I think the brain is really superb uh, function is without regulation to really attracting the flow if even if you have a low pressure everywhere they still with a low resistance pattern they're gonna attract the flow to the brain so these are a few curves now you're gonna see normal ventilation and this is uh, first one is the mean flow velocity the speed and you can see the five different position for normal ventilation and you can see this not, not much change and a really quick adjustments and this is why these adjustments are really looks flat in the velocity because of positivity how the waveform is positive this is where you see that is affecting so positivity meaning that uh, it's calculated for my systole and diastolic value how good is my waveform how low resistance in a moment if something is high resistance harder to perfuse then my PI is go up if something is low resistance like uh, AVM or formations then my PI would be really low. So the PI is really showing why I can really maintain that nice low resistance flow pattern because my brain is, is uh, uh, correcting any changes and this is with hyperventilation there's definitely more uh, adjustment done and this is like all over the place now and these are definitely more than 20 percent differences on the pulsatility changes to keep that flow uh, maintained and with the hypoventilation mean flow velocity maintained very well with again a huge uh, pulsatility changes throughout so this was pre-flight in the flight uh, we did have our testing done this is just one of our, our other uh, pool party so the guys coming out from the pool so this is where they're playing and they are learning how to build the ISS so it's one of those really fun so this is the Canadian partner and my guy is on the other side so they were kind of playing together uh, in a pool together this is just kind of funny just remember what's VIIP stands for if you miss the I so it's not VIP kind of remember so this is the doctor and I had really 30 minutes to really train him and this is how we do the training as uh, giving you a slideshow and giving him a slideshow and after that with a little bit of hands-on so indeed uh, I have some uh, <coughs> special project for you I have two ultrasound machines standby for your afternoon hands-on and you can test each other blood flow if you really uh, this is not an IQ test or anything you just want to make sure you're not brain dead during the conference <laughs> that when you go and leave our conference say hey I learned nothing so we, we have an excuse and say this is why you learn nothing because there's no <laughs> flow right there. Uh, so this is the brain ultrasound as again we were, t we were playing with the same color code and this is uh, he's, he's using what's interesting that for the brain ultrasound for that part we're using the same cardiac probe so the echo probe is the same so it just depends uh, same thing with the colonoscopy it depends on wh which part you're sticking in so the same thing with the echo probe so sorry <laughs> and this is our crew it's really fun to go in 2 a.m. to the NASA and you see like nobody's sitting in a control and this is a uh, they are running by the London uh, time the, so the, the astronauts li leave uh, by the London uh, time zone so we still smiling two o'clock in the morning and uh, we are playing a DJ you know when you do the DJ and you d d d listen to the music and what I really see is I see the ultrasound and I will see the ultrasound image so this is why it's captured because it would be uh, more than hip hop violation if I show you the guy doing the ultrasound itself so oh, we're not gonna do hip hop violation so we do have a special secure network and I don't know who is the provider but we never had a loss of signal when we are talking to these guys you know how many times you lost signal with your cell phone I wish I have a same provider that NASA has <laughs> and, I, and I really wouldn't have any problem and this is again an, another fun that uh, <coughs> with my other radio colleagues uh, you know how they spying on us so I, I thought that they just left my phone on and I spy on them so real time this is not through the window this is like you're walking into the same uh, area and they let us do some <coughs> pictures you know <laughs> and they, they definitely let us uh, do those pictures I'm gonna skip that one um, 
I'm not going to show data, so I can show his face. Uh, this is another astronaut who came back and we did a post uh, fly testing. And I'm not going to discuss any medical <coughs> issues with him. But this is how the ultrasound is done up in the space. Uh, right now, they're just doing it on each other. And sometimes they, uh, again, this is a pre and post fly testing is done by us. Uh, this is just the explanation how the, to push buttons. And this is a case from our hospital. So again, we had a patient with altered mental status and we could not transfer the patient even to the CT. Think about how much, again, uh, equipment we would need to bring. But we did a quick ultrasound and just measuring the same thing what we learned from the astronauts. And again, this is why I like the idea that what we do with the NASA is benefit for all. So they, whatever uh, new invention we have, NASA licensed it back to the medical community free of charge. So those are the really <coughs> easy and really nice uh, uh, working uh, uh, environment. And this is, again, our patient has optic nerve sheet of uh, one centimeter. That one centimeter is like double the normal size. So this is how easy. It's not just like counting millimeters. A normal diameter should be about 0 0.5. And indeed, when uh, she was more stable, this is the whole hemorrhage and all that blood you see in the brain. And this is... Uh, the set part. So OCT, it's another part, this is my own eyeball, that you can do a um, eye exam on the space station. And I just really wanted to show how my eyeballs are not wrinkled and not pushed from behind. So this is what happens when it's pushed behind, it will be wrinkled up. So you can imagine that how you have a pressure with an with a eyeball and then suddenly it's not going to have a nice uh, straight surface. I think that's all uh, what I wanted to start. Um, I'm going to just scare you that uh, if you don't want to learn ultrasound, it's OK. I have a robot already learning the my <laughs> ultrasound. So I trained my robot how to do the ultrasound. And um, it's kind of stunning that it doesn't talk back. It, it, it does everything with the uh, first uh, hand. And again, uh, right now, it's directed by a gentleman hand who is coming from the movie of The Terminator. So he needs to wear a glove, and his glove is basically the robot hand. So the next level would be that when you don't have a gentleman and the Terminator arm is chopped off and how the robot can do everything by himself, uh, the first thing he learned is how to dance. <laughs> so definitely, uh, this is my uh, welcome to Houston message. And uh, on YouTube, uh, if you really would like to see that uh, robot uh, doing a uh, ultrasound, and this is just a special thanks to the team, my doctor colleagues and uh, ultrasonographer. Um, the YouTube uh, has a telemedicine uh, and robonaut uh, video, and I think that was the video who started playing before my lecture. It's basically what we did is we wanted to replace how anesthesiologist is always so slow starting that IJ. So this guy, with one hour, learned how to control the ultrasound with the left hand and stick it twice in the same spot with the same direction with the same target. So within one hour, I just kind of uh, told everybody I, I trained him more than a few of my colleagues within a week. <laughs> so thank you so much. I hope I talk a little bit about perfusion too, but I think it was really good for Houston. I think you did good. Um, any I questions? So uh, I, I want to make one quick comment. Remember Robinot. I want you to remember that GM, uh, that uh, GM is a partner in that. That's going to be important for later. But you would talked about venous congestion. So in space, of course, it's being caused by the microgravity <coughs> or the zero G. So, but what, how does that translate in the operating room? Our, our issue, of course, is you pull the heart up. So you pull the heart up, do the back, you know, the, the circ or OMs or whatever and we start losing our flow, we turn our flow down. So there's a double whammy there. There's a loss of return, and there's a decrease in forward flow because we don't have the volume to do it. How does that affect this? So even without you, they've just, they on off-pump cases. If I see the heart lifted up, the flow tremendously drops and you have increased resistance. 
So we, we, even without your, your pump, we see that the, no, the same scenario in the operating room, just to even to hold the heart and changing the position of the heart, it's made tremendous changes in the, in the flow. So what we think is the venous congestion, and this is where it goes back to the cognitive function changes, that we try to see that don't bl just blame embolization on the cognitive function changes. I think there's a little bit more complex than just blame it, hey, I'm sending debris to the brain and all those that are from the aorta can end up in the brain. I think we need to say that this is just only one of the part of the story. I think the whole story is that the brain needs low resistance perfusion throughout the cardiac cycle. In a moment, you don't provide that low resistance flow in diastole, the brain tells you, hey, I want more flow. And I think this is where we can definitely see that if, if we will define um, the cognitive function a little bit better, we're definitely going to see those changes. So I think right now we are working on to do these cognitive function changes the same time monitoring the blood flow in the brain. So we did uh, uh, one paper, one study that before the cab, uh, we did these uh, cognitive function changes with uh, word finding, testing, and just executive task, uh, very, f f I don't know if you heard this test. So basically, you have words written by different color, and you want to say the word, no. You need to say what is the color of the word. Mm -hmm. So make you think, and those are the change of thinking versus just showing some motor function. We can really see how your brain is really functioning, and at the same time, we are tracking your blood flow. So there's one more parameter for that, so. Okay. That's interesting. Your next talk.